amendment? Sure. David Hall. Good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. This is S324, an act relating to prohibiting robocalls. You should have, I hope you have draft. We got 1.1. 1.1. Yeah, that's a, nice, I copied what you said this morning. Well, that's, has, that's okay. It has 90 days. That's good. Yeah, so. For some reason, our our internal system is no longer updating version numbers, headers, and footers, dates. I don't know why. Ever since, ever since uh, the yeah. IT department became their own little universe, yeah. they're, they're less concerned about <gasps> oh, oh, the well, functionality of our documents. I guess is that on tape as well? I just did it my huge favor, so. I'll tell you. 15th at 1052, is that correct? Yeah. At any rate, the version that you have in front of you, 1.1 uh, of the strike all amendment, does have the changes I believe that you were interested in. Um, those are primarily in subsection C on page 2 of 3, um, where the criminal penalties are changed to uh, not more than 90 days, and the fine is not more than $1,000 per violation of both. And each telephone call is a separate violation under uh, this subsection. David, uh, yeah, yes. Quick, quick question. So, um, we had testimony that the AG's office isn't necessarily going to lay on investigators. Sure. Um, so, it seems like a federal conviction is where we would get the evidence that we would use for this. Is that does that make sense? Uh, that's one viable option, I suppose. So I'm imagining that these robocallers send out waves mm -hmm. of hundreds or thousands. So I'm just wondering, is there a record of, of this happening where under this you'd have evidence that somebody sent out like 5,000 calls to Vermonters? in which case you could have each one a separate violation, um, and then it might be as much as 90 days times that number? That, to follow up on that, that was my question too, is each, that, that you press a button, mm -hmm. does that constitute one call, one telephone call, because it's the same thing going to 500 people, or is the 500 people the, yeah. The sure. one call. Yeah, is it is the the activating yeah. activating the wave of calls? One call. Or That's, is it yeah. Each call, each telephone that rings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it says yeah. telephone call, but it doesn't mm -hmm. define Yeah. That's it says each prohibited telephone call. Yeah. Yeah, I, I gotta tell you that if an enforcement action is brought, then the AG's office is going to exercise its discretion in how to charge it and mm -hmm. They expose If you look at the, unfortunately, they printed this page which had nothing to do with the robocalls. But if you look at this page with the yellow on this article, uh, what it shows is that 46% of robocalls for September 2019 were scams. It seems to me that the Attorney General might have an interest in scams. And maybe not so much going after payment reminders or telemarketing, but at actual scams, which, you know, he's been on the road talking about IRS scams and other forms of scams. So, it, it, you know, it may be true that it would wait for the federal government, but if somebody is scamming people over IRS, you know, claiming to be the IRS, claiming to be the Department of Motor Vehicles, trying to get your personal information, then it does create a criminal offense, and that might. There may be other places in the law that they could go after, but this may be one where usually when the scam occurs, you have some kind of an investigation. You know, somebody reports that somebody took $3,000 from them, you know, before they realized they had given away their <coughs> information. I just think that we, should, we shouldn't just look at it as the telemarketers, but almost half of the of mm -hmm. these things are scams. It was funny, I, uh, my granddaughter 
just as she was reading, I posted the, this, sto this, on, this story about the robocalls calls on Facebook. And as she was reading it, she got a call that her warranty had expired. <laughs> This was her final hot, hot chance. I don't know if that's a scam or a telemarketer, but I, you know, I keep getting them and saying, "Oh my God, that's thank God is the thank God is the final one." You know, your final notice. I think that's, that's a, scam. a scam. I don't know because, never... because they're they're not calling you and saying, "Would you like to have get an extended warranty?" Yeah. We're they're you calling. Think we should be more specific here. Than... Well, I think what I hear David saying is. The AG's office will decide whether yeah. to prosecute, um, depending on the facts. Yeah. And the way the way I read it, they'd be liable for calls. multiple. If there's 500 phone calls with one button, it's 500 violations. And that's or is I it one prefer. violation? No, I believe right. that the way it's, it's per call. It's, it's so per I mean, in your scenario, it sounds a little if bit you but 5,000 calls. 5,000 5, people calls. receive. This phone call that right. it's five thousand violations. Yes, and I'm I'm fine with that. I wanted to make sure it was that, not. That's the way it's written. Okay. Uh, I mean, it sounds like a lot. To, <laughs> but well, it it's is. at the discretion of the. <laughs> I've actually tried to talk to some of these people on occasion just to get this piece of my mind. But as soon as I say I don't want their product, they hang up on me. Rudely, I might add. They're extremely rude. <laughs> Who would have expected? Yeah, who would expect these scammers to be rude? <laughs> well, I I wish I could say otherwise, but my sister in Florida is impaired in a number of ways, and she's four or five times she's fallen prey to these sorts of things where she sends four thousand dollars. The the most recent one was somebody called and said that they, so they found out on Facebook she was a, a fan of this particular rock star. And they said, and this person needs someone in Florida to help coordinate their, so can you send us your, your information and then we'll consider you to be this person's Florida representative, Adam Lambert. Is his name. And so she wound up four or $5,000 just oh. out of her account. Oh. That's terrible. Yeah. But you know, cold cold calling people in a certain age group um, that they think are yeah. Well, this isn't part of this bill, but obviously the Department of Motor Vehicles nationwide. It's not just in Vermont selling their information. Yeah. And then having it used is is also an issue that I don't know if the transportation committees are taking that up. Or who is? But we should be taking that up. Mr. Chairman, I move S324 favorably. Senator Bruce moved S324 favorably. Is there any further discussion? I'm mad as hell. And I'm not going to take it anymore. Shout it to the rooftop. I'm going to stop paying my phone bill, and then I won't have a phone. <laughs> right. Well, they find another way. <laughs> yes. All right, all in favor. Oh, please call the roll, Peggy. Senator White? Yes. Senator Bruce? Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. And Senator Benning votes yes. Well, we can. you can yes. hold it open. You can hold it well, open. Well, no, he actually told me he wanted oh, to okay. vote yes. So, and I, we can hold it open for Senator Nedka. Okay. Who wants to report this, Jim? Not me. I'll, I'll oh, I'll, I'll, I, I would love to do it. I don't mind. I yeah. want to do okay, this because you you're going to do the mental health. You always do mental health. Okay, I do. <laughs> you, you are right. I do. Um, David, you Thank you, David. Anything to clean copy? Huh? Oh, David. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. okay. The two hardest bills I've ever reported out were the burn pit bill and the Kulagowski. This is the Kulagowski. Kulagowski was just horrible. Case I think the Northeast Kingdom where the guy was let out of uh, the retreat and. And um, he ended up being the best uh, pajamaker in his, the furnace with the guy. And um, it was very, very hard. Do you know what rescue remedy is? It's a Bach flower essence. So rescue is 
supposed to calm you down. Mm -hmm. It's almost a whole time before I reported that. Okay, Senator Nitka. Sorry. That's okay. Um, you just missed the vote on the robocalls. I'm assuming that you're against when, um, You're for the bill against <coughs> robocalls? You missed your professional. Senator Nitka. Yes, okay. so no, there were no changes from the last version that we debated. Okay, great. Um, so now we'll take up. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take up the uh, the bill on. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Now that Alice is here, we can get Charlie Sand. The mental health. Um, the act relating to competency to stand trial. Oh, yeah, we did the robocall. All right, are there any other persons who, I, I don't know if I dreamt it or if I actually received suggestions from the Hospital Association of Changes. I must have it. I must have. It says a lot about me if I'm dreaming Just about the, this bill. The one piece about adding a representative on the forensic. Yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> well, Eric's going to walk us through the latest draft. So you yeah, how interesting my life is. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Morning. Are we on 5.1? Yes, exactly. I believe so. Still on 5.1? Yep. That's the status at the moment. Okay. Eric Fitzpatrick with the, the Office of Legislative Counsel here to walk the committee through, uh, as you were saying, Senator Sears version 5.1, which is oh, the most... I have Senator, wait, I have Senator Bennett's. I didn't think those notes looked like my writing. Oh, sorry about that. Is that online? Yeah. 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 I was looking at the and saying, yes, it is. Sorry about that. Why did I write those things? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, so yes, this is uh, version 5.1 of the committee strike call amendment to S-183, an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. Remember, we've been through several versions before, and, and the issues I think will be familiar to the committee. I'll recap just a little bit where we are. You see, that generally speaking, the bill is dealing with uh, the criminal procedures around when a criminal defendant uh, has, the issue has come up as to whether the defendant is competent to stand trial or was sane at the time the offense was committed. And uh, the highlights, as usual, indicate where the changes are between this draft and the previous one that you looked at. The very first section you see in front of you was just a complete strike of that first section. And you, that was the issue, if you may remember, it being discussed about the Commissioner of Mental Health being a party uh, yeah. during these proceedings. And this strike isn't, isn't removing the issue completely. You'll just see that it's moved a little bit later in the bill. In, in a sense, it's uh, later in the proceedings as well. When it appears here, this is, uh, or has originally proposed, this provided commissioner party status uh, during an earlier stage of the proceedings before the, uh, before the court has started to consider whether or not the person actually should be committed to the department or not. So. Uh, the commissioner, uh, you'll see, will still get party status later on at that stage of the proceedings. But I think it was decided uh, among the people involved in the process that that made more sense, timing-wise. So that provision is struck here. And so that, well, then we'll move on to section, what is now section one. And this has to do with the, uh, once a person's uh, sanity or competency is placed at issue, the court orders an examination. So there's be a psychiatric or, um, or uh, uh, psychologist examination of the person's mental health status in order to determine whether or not they are in fact um, competent to stand trial or were insane at the time of the offense. So there's some uh, proposals here and you see I'll just sort of refresh your recollection about lines say one through six of page two. There are no changes to that to that particular um, subsection but to remind you what's going on there is if you see, if you see the existing language sort of one of the um, points about it that has been noticed by a lot of people over the years is that the way the language is phrased, that these examinations have to have reference to mental competency, competency and sanity. 
But it's not always the case that both mental competency and right. sanity are at issue in a given case. They're two different things, and it may be one, it may be the other. So this is, uh, the language has changed to make it clear that that's the case, that the, that the examination can be one or both of the following. It may be that both will be at issue, but maybe not. And this allows for the examination to, to cover both, uh, sorry, either mental competency or sanity. Now that's important to know because that's related to the new subdivision at the bottom of page two. This has to do with, well, what about those situations where both competency and sanity are at issue? And the proposal there is that, well, if that's the case, if the, if the psychiatric examination is looking at both the person's competency and sanity, then um, competent, competency has to be done first. And you'll see in the, the, uh, the second line that it's not until after the psychologist or psychiatrist is able to form the opinion that the person is competent to stand trial, it's not until after that that an examination of the defendant's sanity will take place. Now that is still the same concept in front of you, but I think it was Senator Benning who brought up that the language is a little clear, was a little unclear on that point, mm -hmm. that it, it seemed to imply that that sequence would always be the case, when the intent was only that that sequence would be the case when both competency and sanity mm -hmm. were at issue. Mm -hmm. So the language is clarified, as you see in line 18, it has, it's only when the, when the psychiatrist or psychologist has been asked to provide opinions as to both competency and sanity, and then line 20, in such cases. So only in those cases is it the case that um, competency has to go first and sanity has to go we'll, second. We'll try and just walk through to ask right now if there's anybody on the committee or in the audience who has any concerns, comments, or questions about section yeah. Uh, please identify yourself for the record. This is Jack McCullough, Director of the Mental Health Law Project at the Legal Aid. I'm looking at uh, the amendment to Section 1 of the bill, and I'm wondering if the strikeout of G1 is inadvertent, and if the only thing that was really intended to be removed is that subsection 7 on line 16 and 17. You mean that that the result of the of this is not that G one would be struck from the law? Okay. That, no, this is just striking any amendment. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yes, you bet. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? So I assume that one section one is fine with the result. Section two. Yes. Uh, section two, so again, so now we're a little bit further along in the proceedings. So this is after the examination uh, has taken place and there's been a finding by the court that the person was either insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial. When that happens, the court then has to hold a hearing to decide, well, what, what should happen to this person? And that really turns on whether the person is dangerous to self or others, whether they're a person in need of treatment. If they find that the person is a danger, then they're committed to the Department of Mental Health. That's the, stat, that's the way the law works currently. However, uh, I think the, um, the situation now is that when that proceeding is taking place, when there's this determination as to whether or not the person should be committed to the Department of Mental Health, uh, Vermont Legal Aid does not represent the person at that time. It would be uh, if the person has either representation from the Defender General's office or has private defense counsel, that's the person who represents the defendant at that stage of the proceedings. Also, the Department of Mental Health is, doesn't necessarily have a right to appear at the proceedings either. So those are the two issues that are addressed in the new language at the top of page four. So, so you're at that stage of the proceedings where there's being a determination being made as to whether or not the person is dangerous. I think he's going to be there all day. Right. <laughs> He's going to be there all morning. So. Eric. Yeah. That last <coughs> sentence, the Department of Mental Health shall be entitled to appear mm -hmm. at the proceeding and be represented by the Office of the Attorney General. I'm just wondering about that last part. Why is Department of Mental Health represented by the AG? I think, and I'll let both, uh, both uh, the agencies speak themselves, but I believe that that's the way functionally it works. That okay. they have an attorney in the uh, attorney, and they have counsel in the attorney general's office who represents DMH. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I may, uh, Morning Fox, uh, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Um, Eric's exactly right. Uh, all of our cases, when uh, for hospitalization hearings and voluntary hospitalizations, 
medication orders, things of that sort. Uh, the department is represented by uh, the attorney, assistant attorney generals uh, that are assigned to the Department of Mental Health. Uh, so we're, we're always represented, almost always, but, uh, but uh, by the attorney generals. Uh, to that point of that, that, that line, I did want to check in with the committee's uh, intent of the language on that line. It says that uh, DMH would be entitled to appear. Uh, and I'm just curious if that intent is to allow us to actually have party status so we can bring witness or just that we are entitled to appear, uh, which wouldn't necessarily give us that that level of, of uh, uh, representation in court. Hmm. Our ask was uh, for party status. I don't. So know. that's really a policy yeah. question for the committee, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I think this was the, the compromise language. I believe that. Jack McCullough and maybe others, maybe Matt Valerio felt there was a conflict for you to be a party. I wasn't sure what that meant, as I'm recalling. And this, that's what I was understanding of this. So maybe Jack. Yes, uh, Jack McCullough again from the Department of from <coughs> Mental Health Project. I think the intention, by phrasing it as the department shall be entitled to appear, I think that includes the ability to call witnesses. They're not just there and observing. So I think they get to appear, they get to provide call witnesses, they get to make argument before the court, but they're not a party the way the state and the defendant are parties to the criminal case. Um, and if the committee wanted to make that clear by saying, shall be entitled to appear and call witnesses, that would be uh, Consistent with what we've been talking about. That was going to be my exact suggestion. I look for fear and call it. Okay. Hmm. Thought. And the other uh, <coughs> substantive issue that's going on in that in that subsection is. In lines four to five, it's that a counsel is being appointed um, for the defendant from Vermont Legal Aid. So the person we represented by Vermont Legal Aid, uh, rather than, and again, I think uh, both Matt and Jack would know better how this works currently, but uh, my understanding is that currently the person is represented by either the Defender General's Office or private counsel if they have private counsel. They could always get private counsel. This is something we've talked about for a number of years, that uh, after the finding of uh, incompetence to stand trial and the like, once you get to the hospitalization hearing stage, that it might be better for legal aid to pick that up uh, as they end up doing that work that they, identically down the road. Uh, they, they find mixed results with, I guess, the way the criminal lawyers attack those situations. Well, but would this still give that person the right? You know, and I'm going to say this. And I don't mean it to be funny, but would it give them the right to have Alan Dershowitz represent them? Can I always choose they can always choose to not do legal aid. It's just yes. that the court would appoint somebody from legal aid, and then if the person said, "I want Alan Dershowitz," and Alan was available and wanted to do it. Yes, over the years we have on Notice I didn't say Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> over the years we've occasionally had uh, one of our clients retain private counsel to do just the regular commitment case, cases. It's not that common, but they're certainly entitled to it. No, I'm case. assuming that it isn't, but that, that, that's still available. That yeah. Include that for this date. Okay. Okay. Just to follow up on that one point, I don't know, Peggy, did you by any chance hear back from Stephanie on the uh, on the fiscal note issue, or? I did not email her. Ah, I did not. probably not then yet. I got that email last night, and I... No worries. So uh, I think Stephanie is working on a fiscal note on that yeah. issue, too. I know you would ask for that, Senator Sears, about it. Well, we'll get that on the floor now. Right. right. Whether the bill would have to go to appropriations or not. Mm -hmm. 
So moving on to the next section, section three. Uh, now, so this is again a little bit further down in the chronology of the proceedings. So let's just uh, narrow out the point where if the court has found that the person was either incompetent to stand trial or uh, insane at the time of the offense, and that the person was a danger to self or others, and they committed the person to the Department of Mental Health. So that's where section three kicks in. And this raises the issue that the committee has been discussing as well. If the person has been committed and they're subsequently discharged, there currently isn't any provision in law about uh, victims getting notice in those situations. So the committee is wanting to add some language uh, around providing victims with notice when the person is going to be discharged, either from, and I'm over on page six now, lines five to six, when yep. it, so the person is going to be discharged either from the secure mental health treatment facility or from the care and custody of the commissioner. The proposal is that uh, notice of that action be provided to the state's attorney, who then provides notice to the victim. Now, the difference you see on lines 11 and 12 is the idea is to change it to, uh, originally it was uh, an opt-in provision, but now it's going to be opt-out. So uh, the state attorney would provide notice to any victim who has not opted out of receiving notice, is the idea. Okay. That's the only change to the previous version. Uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And I think it's been our position from the beginning that this only applies to the Big 12 offenses and that, um, you know, victims of domestic abuse and violations of abuse prevention order have just as much of an interest in receiving that notice as others. So it would be our recommendation to extend that to listed crimes. Okay. And why? And, and why? It's just that the, there are a number of listed non-Big 12 offenses that are very violent that, uh, that victims would like to get notice if all of a sudden uh, Department of Mental Health is then going to discharge their care and custody of that individual. Yeah, but right now they don't get any notice. Nobody gets notice. They get notice within the first 90 days. This would be extending that beyond 90 days. Yeah, and I... <coughs> I don't know what kind of burden that places on the department to run on others. It would be minimal um, mm -hmm. for the department to be able to make those notifications. Uh, you know, we just we'll need to make sure we're aware of the, the different charges that this will fall under. And uh, as the language states, you know, the intent, and we've talked closely with the state's attorney's office that uh, that this kind of notification can happen they're discharging from a secure hospital or facility and still under the custody of the commissioner, or uh, if the department is intending to discharge someone from the care and custody of the commissioner, or to not even uh, reapply to continue in custody if the decision this, this should is, not apply. This this will will cover the state's attorney, though, and the state's attorney just has the responsibility yes. to notify the victim. Correct. Can I ask a question? Or maybe I'll let Eric walk through first, because I this is kind of a general question. Okay. So, any other any objection to that? To add, making it listed crime? Current. It was current version, and the state's supposed to be adding listed crime. You know, I've had an issue with listed crimes being a kind of expanded list that uh, you know you have some driving offenses in there and uh, that kind of thing. So it's only when the, when the victim asks for the information. Isn't it when the victim doesn't opt out? When they have an opt out. When they have an opt out. I mean, to me, this is about <coughs> particular crimes of violence that people should be concerned about. And, uh, you know, I mean, if that's the way it goes out, that's the way it goes out. But I'm, that it is. I think what this was designed to be for it was for the crimes of violence, but you would probably know since you wrote it. <laughs> well, I never intended for listed trans to become this big, but right. why don't we just say, but if you add crimes of violence, then somebody who commits a simple assault in a bar room brawl would be, I don't know how many of them are included. Right, that's why I was. Oh, those are not uncommon to end up in the mental health system. Simple assaults, misdemeanor domestics, disorderly conducts, that kind of thing. Um, 
Well, so that's so the Department of State's attorneys has proposed that we expand beyond the Big Twelve to all listed tribes. Is there any discussion of that? Does the committee want to move forward with that or no? I mean, is it not only from the Department of Mental Health, but is is it possible to do? And does the person have to wait well, until you get that morning, notice uh, out? Mr. Fox just said it was. They, they didn't have a problem with that. We just need to know which <laughs> which they just clients need to know which clients are supposed to report to the state's attorneys on it. Correct. So does it mean that yeah. the patient would have to wait much longer until you notify to all those no. persons? No. We well. make one notification to the state's attorney. Oh, you're saying okay, and then state's attorney might state's attorney might be is, months. Is the one responsible to to notify the victim? Well, if the victim wants. This is unless the victim unless opts out. out. Right. Well, unless the victim has said, I don't want to know. Yeah. I'd like to know from the state's attorneys if they can do it. Well, they just said. They, yeah, we, they we, proposed? Sorry. Oh, you did. We can do it. Oh, that's yeah. right. You wanted it. Yeah. Sorry, you wanted it. <laughs> All right. If they say they want it, okay, I guess. This does remind me of a conversation that came up. Uh, the only reason I bring it up is because once before, when you were creating the offense of felon in possession of a firearm, and you thought listed crimes was too broad, you said listed crimes except for, and you and you exempted a few things like the driving offense oh, yeah, and uh, and a few other things. So let's do that. Because look at that approach. Yeah. It's sort yeah, of yeah. just bottom <coughs> that list. We rather than going through the entire yeah. list again, mm -hmm. which would you certainly could yeah, do that. Take a little more time. We did in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. And exempted a few. I think driving some driving offenses, some other things yeah. that were that to deemed not to be as violent. Yeah. Yeah. You voted yes, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. On Thank you. <clears throat> and many other things. You're you voted in favor of. It. We passed four bills while you were gone. That's good. And you voted yes on all of them. None of them matter because I was testifying on my helmet. Before. We passed that in here. I did made the additional helmet statement on public television. Here we are, page six. Go ahead and ask it, then you can. Now you have to have a seatbelt on your bike. <laughs> if you're smoking Andrew, marijuana. That's what Andrew was talking about. <laughs> um, getting really? back to Eric's, so the suggestion <sighs> is that we revise this to be similar to what we did with firearms and not all listed crimes, but Certain listed crimes, which would be listed crimes like we we need to get new designations until there's a classification system. We'll call them level one and level two listed crimes. <laughs> we need more lists. We need more lists. So we're just doing the level one listed crimes. Here. Sounds good. I can, uh, Boy, if anybody wants to go that route, I can put some language in the next draft so you can take a look at that. Yep. So, no changes to section four about the disclosure for the prosecution of uh, mental health examinations uh, for purposes of the defendant's competency. That's still the same issue that was debated last time, you may recall. Um, no changes in language to that. Where are we? Uh, that is seven. bottom of page six, top of page seven. Yep. I think you probably recall that one would expect that the that case will be litigated and mm -hmm. um, the court will weigh in. Yep. Um, no changes to section five, corrections, the assessment of mental health services. Over in section six, the forensic care work group. Yeah, this remember. is where I dropped this. This was in this section. They actually did ask you. You didn't read. I just dropped that they, oh. that they, that somebody from the hospital association wanted me to have specific suggestions on this section. Yes. <laughs> the, is that the line 14 and 15? Yes. The, yeah, so you added to the forensic care working group two, two different uh, other parties, yep. the, men, the mental health care ombudsman and a representative of the designated hospitals appointed by the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Healthcare System. 
Lucio missed that. So. <laughs> I, this was the section. We're on page eight. This is the section that I was dreaming about. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I didn't dream it. Yeah. I got an email about it. Thank you. Oh, that's a, that's medical society. I know. Well, close enough, though. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. 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 You know, when I'm in the hospital, I can't distinguish between a doctor and a hospital association. <laughs> Tell you the truth, I just care about who's poking You didn't just speak on their behalf. What was their? Uh, they like this. Yeah, we like yeah. it too. Cool. You, you want to speak on behalf of the medical association? I don't think I have that power, no. but. <laughs> I was Lucy Guerin, representing the Vermont Medical Association. <laughs> 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 yes. Can I ask on uh, line seven, page eight? Glad to know I didn't dream about it. <laughs> it, it says that uh, Department of Mental Health shall convene a working group of interested stakeholders, including as appropriate. I don't, I've never, I don't remember that language before. Who decides wh who in that list is appropriate? Uh, I'm going to defer to Katie on that one. Could I help with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah please. Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council, for the record. So the responsibilities of the working group are two very kind of different um, assessments that they're doing. One is more policy, and one is more about the physical building. Mm -hmm. And so when we're putting the list together, um, for example, we included BGS. BGS probably isn't going to weigh in on the policy decisions, but they would be more appropriate to weigh in on the physical facility piece and subdivision two. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to give some flexibility um, that um, the most appropriate parties would be weighing in on the the most appropriate question, the, the question that they'd be most um, helpful with. I guess I, I understand that. I guess it still leaves open the question, what if somebody feels that they're appropriate to the other discussion, mm -hmm. but somebody else feels that they're not? Mm -hmm. Who, who's the deciding authority in that case? Usually it would be laid out who, who is on or not on. I guess it's the Department of Mental Health the way I read this. Yeah, I would read it to be the Department of Mental Health. Okay. As, lo as long as we're clear on... They're convening the working group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And line 16 and 17 says that the Department of Mental Health can include any other interested party yeah. as they permit. Oh, so. the, the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services feels slighted. They can complain to the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it's fine because it's a working group of, yeah. you know, administration officials mostly. Anyway. Well, except for the hospital association. And the person with lived yeah, experience. I'm so glad that you got that found out. I'm going to go print it out and give it to you. <laughs> So that's the, the list of the members of the working group, as Katie was alluding to. What comes next in the, in the uh, language is what the working group actually uh, considers, studies, and uh, reports back on. And you'll see that there's a new, some new language over on the top page nine. This has been moved. Remember, the, the draft yep. originally had proposed legislation required specifically that would be uh, sort of incorporating a Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board model into Vermont law. Remember that? And there was discussion about, well, that was probably too specific and maybe just have the committee consider that option rather than necessarily require specific legislation. So that's why it's added into this list of I issues that the committee considers. And if you turn over onto page 10, line 7 to 8, you see it's struck there. The report had originally required proposed draft legislation, adapting that Connecticut Psychiatric Review Board model. That is struck. Uh, but there's just sort of some general language there at the bottom that provides the, that if the working group um, does identify any needed changes to statute, that's the legislation, proposed legislation, that would have to be included in the report. I haven't heard from Stephanie yet. She, I sent her the latest draft. Oh, thank you. And I'm waiting to hear back from her. Thanks. 
Not from uh, no other changes. Nothing. Nothing else on the draft. Um. So we do have a couple of slight changes. Yep. So I'm wondering if, if was if there anybody in the audience who has any concerns with this draft that would be amended shortly? Okay. Um. What I'm going to suggest, Eric, is would a half an hour be enough time? Yep. Why don't we get back together for you and Kate between now and 11.30 and have a final draft to vote on? Sounds good. You don't have to highlight where it's different. Right. It's some really clean. Just, right. It's just cleaning it up. Yep. And so we'll get back together at 11.30. Got it. Um, next on Thursday, we're going to start at 8.15 and end at 11, at 10.25. And that's all about Woodside for anybody that's interested. Senator Bruce, you won't be here. I'll be gone. And Friday, I need, because Joe will be gone on Friday, so it's just going to be the three of us. So. Is it Thursday at 8.15 or tomorrow? Oh, Friday. Thursday at 8.15 okay. to yep. 11.25. Because we've got that, heard that song on the way up. <laughs> Bowling fingers. So. <laughs> Eric, good work. Thank you very much. Um, I actually, we don't have our hard copy, hand, hard copy right. in front of me. Well, Peggy, do you have oh. any other copies? Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Eric, uh, Thank the, you. Do you have the other one too? By chance? The, uh, oh, do you have the other one too? Oh, the list the first hand out is you've done yeah. it, and that's very really helpful to see here, what it is, please. what what okay. we've done here. Thanks. Uh, oh, in terms of I gave him mine. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I'm looking for you. No, I have. That are not included. I'm sorry, sir. Should we say that one more time? The listed crimes. Yes, the, the listed crimes uh, statute that I printed out that you see in front of you is the current existing list of all the offenses that uh, are within the definition of a listed crime. So you see, it's a lengthy list. It looks to be uh, 31 offenses long. So, as opposed to the Big 12, which is obviously, well, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, if you look at, if you now take a look at the proposed amendment over on page five. Now, this again, you remember, there's no highlights or strike through here, so this right. is a clean copy. But the version that you had previously looked at was Big 12, so that that the, the notification to victims would kick in for a big 12 offense under the previous draft. Now you look at line 11, that's uh, for a person found, uh, found not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stay in trial for a listed crime as defined in subdivision 53017, which is what you have in your handout, other than, and that's just word for word out of the uh, felons in possession of a firearm statute oh. in 13 VSA 4017, or I think it might be 4016, 4016 or 17. Um, which is that you went through this process back then in which there was a concern about maybe the listed crimes were too broad to prohibit someone from possessing a firearm. So you went through and sort of tried to cull out a few that were not as, uh, in the view of the committee, as violent or as serious as the others. I shouldn't use the word serious. They're all serious, but certainly didn't. So didn't. this pulls out lewd and lascivious but leaves in lewd and lascivious for the child. Correct. So this is just identical to that list right. of listed crimes with half a dozen exceptions, which leaves you with, by my count, 25 offenses that would be covered um, as opposed to the big 12. Mm -hmm. The only other change to this draft is over on page three, line 14. This has to do with the Department of Mental Health uh, ability to participate 
in the proceedings around um, commitment, and you see that the words and call witnesses are added on line 14. They shall be BMH is entitled to appear and call witnesses at the proceeding and be represented by the Office of the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Isn't, uh, uh, maybe it's fine, it just seems a little odd that they are appearing, calling witnesses, and being represented. Is that typical? Yeah, I think the representative does, it doesn't, uh, that's just who their counsel is in okay. the proceeding. Okay. It, it, no, I think their counsel is an assistant attorney general. Yeah. All the, all the uh, counsels in all the agencies are uh, in the attorney general's office and are assigned. No, I get that, but it, so so that's who their counsel is is from the attorney general's office. And that was my question on the previous language, which I had answered. But here, it adds that DMH can call witnesses, and it sounds like they're doing that themselves rather than through their representative of the AG, um, or at least that's why I asked the question. Oh, um, but. If, if it makes sense to everybody else, then I'm fine with that. What page is that on again? Page three. Because if they're represented by mm -hmm. the AG, then it seems like the AG would have the ability to call witnesses. I think the representation sort of identifies who is their counsel, okay. as opposed to what they can do. Okay. So then, you so this so makes everything manifest. Correct. Okay. You could change it to say the Department of Mental Health, <coughs> represented by the Office of the Attorney General's Office, shall be entitled to. Yeah. Appear and call witnesses. But I think this is fine. If, okay. If that's everybody's understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Anybody with any further discussion on this bill? Um, there will be a fiscal note, um, and I would like to vote it out, but um, hold on to it until Senator Lyons' committee has had a chance to look at it. Okay. So in that case, I would move uh, we amend 183 with draft 6.1. Senator White has moved that we amend S-183 with draft 6.1. Is there any further discussion? Peggy, was there? Oh, no. all in favor of an amendment? Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Now I would propose that we approve that we send out the paperwork recommendation S-183 as amended. Senator White has moved that we report S-183 as amended favorably to the full Senate. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Peggy, would you please Senator White? Call the roll? Yes. Senator Baruth? Yes. Senator Benning? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. Yes. Senator Nika, uh, Senator White, would you like to report this? I will. Thank you. Uh, would you also let Senator Lyons know that we would like to meet that you'd like to meet with our committee on it? I will. I think you know Senator Lyons. I think. Uh, I do know her. <laughs> they live in the mansion. They live in the same mansion. <laughs> the mansion on the hill? The the mansion mansion on the hill. Nice mm -hmm. the it's house. a very nice house. Um, the, the it's, uh, nice. Thank you all for the work on this. To, glad that we could come together on this bill and uh, that there is unanimity. I think the one place where there still is an issue is the Defender General on page five there about the, or wherever that is about submitting to us. Well, it would be horrible but if it went over to the House without something to <laughs> argue about. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Katie and Eric, for working Thank together. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. I think it may end up being the most important part of the forensic study and see where we end up. <laughs> 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 <laughs>